Most gracious heavenly God, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. Have you ever said anything just to chap somebody off? <laughs> there are whole television shows called daytime soap operas that are designed around this premise. You know, drama, isn't that what it is? Have, have, have you ever said something just to, just to chap somebody off? Um, you know, sometimes it's done as a means of teaching, and I think that's what Jesus is doing in this. This story is designed to upset. It's designed to upset us. When I was in banking, uh, there was a day that one of my uh, really large customers called Bob. Uh, Bob picked up the phone, he called me. It had been a long weekend, and he had a lot of different convenience stores. We'd lent Bob millions of dollars. He had many convenience stores, and they were really good operators. If I was ever going to go into that business, uh, somebody tackled me before I do, because I know enough about it, but they really knew what they were doing. They knew how to pick their locations. They were really good at it, and we did their cash clearing, which is you know, when they drive the armored cars around, they pick up the coins, they do all that, they clear their money, and they miss the cutoff for the window on Friday. I'll interpret that for you. That meant they weren't getting interest paid for three days over the weekend for all of their deposits. And Bob called me on Tuesday morning because he missed the cutoff for the window, and he really didn't like the person who ran that operation. Anybody ever have any of these things happen at work? <laughs> so Bob calls me and I said, and, and he caught me in a particularly surly mood. Can you imagine that? Don't, don't think too hard. <laughs> so Bob caught me in one of those moods. I was having kind of a day already. It was Tuesday morning. We'd already missed Monday. We were trying to get all caught up. Bob calls me and he tells me what happens. And I said, Bob, how much money was it? And he told me, and I reached over, and for those of you who are old enough, I knew how to run a 10 key by touch. There's a few people nodding their head. So clack, 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 and it finished ringing up the number, and I go, Bob, it was $19.90. Tell me you didn't call me over 20 bucks. And there was silence. What? <laughs> it was his 20 bucks. Well, that may be so. <laughs> But I, I, you know, I let it be silent for a while. And finally, I'm like, Bob, you still there? And he said, I'm so mad I can't speak. I said, I was going for irritated. I overshot. <laughs> I said that just to irritate him. And I said, look, Bob, uh, in, in, just to let you kind of know, I had taken him to Rockets games, and we sat on the floor because we were sponsors, and there was not even a price tag on the tickets. The, the doctor for the team sat next to us, and then the bench. Uh, these tickets, I have no idea how much they were, but we were sponsors. We spent over a million dollars a year on that. So just kind of guess. We would go to dinner and I would buy a dinner for he and his wife, my and my wife. And you can imagine what those dinners cost, two, three, four hundred, whatever it cost. Uh, I lent him millions of dollars. And so I said, look, Bob, I know you're upset. I'll take you out to dinner. We'll go to some Rockets games. We'll go spend hundreds, maybe a thousand bucks, uh, uh, you know. And on the next loan, you know, I'll take some of your fees off so the 20 bucks won't be there. And he said, well, that still doesn't make me happy. I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to fix the bank. <laughs> that ain't happening, Bob. <laughs> you know, there are points in times in life we, we do things to try to drive our point home. Bob, it, it, is, it is just 20 bucks. Your time and my time, uh, this is a bad business decision for us to have this long of a conversation about 20 bucks. And so I did it to irritate him. Uh, he didn't end up leaving, if you guys are curious about that. Deb said, always finish the story. And, and we got along just famously after that. But Jesus told this story to highlight the difference between the kingdom of God and what the world is like. 
The kingdom of God is very different than what the world is like. And so, I'll have to equate this story. I was, I was reading a book this past week, and it was talking about as we learn new things, many times our old way of thinking gets in the way of the new learning. Uh, and so it came with a really good example. Uh, I don't think anybody here is old enough to have transitioned from buggies to cars. And if you are, don't raise your hand. <laughs> don't point at anybody. <laughs> My grandmother did. My grandmother, uh, they still had the buckboard that they moved from Grapevine to Cleburne in. And it was, I didn't know it was a buckboard because it was a pile of rusty metal. But she insisted that it was the, the wagon they moved in. Apparently, if you got the wood, you could put it all back together. But she pointed at it and they had moved in a buckboard, horse drawn. Now, if you learn to drive, uh, a buckboard, if you learn to drive with horses, you guys know how you stop them? You do this, right? And you yell out magic words. Whoa, right? You, whoa, if you want them to go, you do this. Okay, so if you transition to driving a car and all of a sudden you get panicked, does it work to pull the steering wheel back to stop? Right? In a moment of panic, what happens? You're betrayed by all of the muscle memory that you've had. You need to what? If you're going to learn how to drive and get, get the feet pedal thing, this one goes, this one stops, right? In the moment of panic, you're betrayed by what? You're learning that you've had all your life. So to overcome that, you have to constantly go out and practice and practice, and then your muscle memory, it will begin to be taken over. I equate it like this. When they got a car, they had a car, but they still had their old learning. Now, what is it when we come into the kingdom of God? We come into the kingdom of God and we have all the rights and benefits of being a Christian, but our old way of thinking is still there. Our old way of thinking is imported into the kingdom of God, or another way I put it, a lot of times as Christians, we live with a Christian heart, but we continue with the veneer of the world around us. We, we bring the veneer of the world with us as we come to the kingdom. And we haven't fully learned to live into all that we have because we have to practice. We have to learn this different way of thinking. Our Old Testament scripture today, which I didn't have read uh, because it's a long passage, is when the Israelites have just moved out. They've gone across the Red Sea. You remember where we were last week? And then all of a sudden they're out in the desert and there's not enough food to eat. And what do the people begin to do? You guys know this one. They grumble and they mumble. But it's amazing. Does that have anything to do with today? I'll leave that alone for a minute. So they grumble and mumble because they'd have no food. And they literally say it would have been better if we would have died in Egypt would have been better if we'd have died in Egypt than been brought out into the desert to starve to death. Now, I, I have to feel some empathy for them because I haven't ever missed any meals. Can y'all tell? I missed less meals since I got here, but that's right, less, not fewer, right? Okay, I gained weight. <laughs> God bless my little heart. I get lost sometimes. So, I can feel some empathy because I have never been without meals. I don't know what I would say. I may have been griping as well. I might have been in that same boat. But they literally said this, we would rather have remained slaves than try to learn how to be free and learn how to be dependent on God. See, God began to give them manna. We sang that today, manna, enough for each day. Now, if you've been raised and all you know is a slave mindset, and then all of a sudden you move out and God wants to teach you about freedom, God's going to have to transform you from dependence upon your masters to dependence on God. And what better way than going, here's your food for today. And tomorrow, here's your food for today. Here's your food for today. You see, it was doled out each day so that what? that you could learn that this doesn't stop the car. you got to learn to move into the kingdom. And Jesus tells this story 
so that we may know transformation, so we don't continue to think the way that we've always thought by just bringing that into the church. This past week, we um, met at the gathering. We had a special speaker come. The bishop came, and uh, we had this guy named Mike Slaughter. I don't know if you've ever heard of Mike Slaughter. He's, um, he just retired as pastor of Ginghamsburg. Uh, it's a little bitty town in Ohio, and it's probably one of the largest Methodist churches in the world now. Started there in 1979, so he's got a little head start on me, but it's grown and it's become a very large church and they do a lot of ministry. And one of the most significant things I heard him say is the church doesn't need volunteers. The church needs people who've been transformed and set free by the Holy Spirit to do what God has made them to do. Do you hear the difference? There's a difference between being a volunteer, somebody who's a hired hand who shows up and expects a wage, and being somebody who's been set free by the Holy Spirit to do what God made you to do with passion. Those are two very different things. And as the church, we're to help set people free to do ministry, put you in the ministry business. My job as the preacher, is not to do all the ministry of the church. If that was your expectation, just stop. My job is to equip the church to do ministry. Consider me a consultant. Although they do, do well, don't they? to consult, to bring in. So there is this mind change, this thing that we have to learn how to do. When I first uh, began doing prison ministry, one of the things that happened was uh, I was I was like a fish out of water. You ever know that feeling? You're learning to do something new and you're not comfortable with it yet and you're not very good and then after a few times you start getting a little better. Y'all all have lived through this, right? So... Um, Anyway, I was doing some prison ministry, and I was going, and you know, at first, I thought people who were in prison really deserve prison and probably worse. Does that kind of tell you where I was? So uh, as I was going cell to cell and visiting with people, one day an, an inmate came by me and a guard was standing next to me, and, and I said something like, God bless you, you know, may you, may you have a good day, and, and just a really kind of Christian greeting to him, and the guard leaned over and told me this, you don't know what he has done. To which I looked at the guard and I go, you don't know what I've done. And I thought, where did that come from? <laughs> it, it came from doing ministry and touching the place of my heart. If you go and do ministry, it'll change you. Uh, Richard, did we get that? Yeah, we did. Well, let's take a look at the, this is, I like the far side. Um, this was one of my favorite ones. It's Rex who is riding a unicycle, juggling, and he's got a cat in his mouth with a bowl on his head. And it says, while Rex is doing good at his new job, he can't shake the thought that he is an old dog, and this is a new trick. <laughs> that just tickles my sense of humor. Can't shake the thought that he is an old dog, and this is a new trick. I want, I want to tell you something about when we begin to move fully into the kingdom of God, when we begin to touch that passion, it will make you uncomfortable. And there will be times when you're thinking, this is, this is difficult, this is hard. If you're not doing that, you're not growing. We're taken to that place. But remember what Jesus said in Revelation, I am making all things new. When we are called to be transformed, God is making us new. Moving us into a new place. Good, we're back to that. So our district superintendent was here on Thursday and he, he told a really wonderful story. He uh, was down in the Gulf Coast area doing mucking out of houses where they go in and cut the sheetrock, they drag everything out. And they'd gone with several other clergy and they were cleaning out some uh, parsonages. And he said, and all of a sudden, a team of people showed up who had gotten in their car that morning, uh, quite a few had driven down, had just driven up to the house and came and knocked on the door and said, do you need some help? We're here to help. And he began to think, well, usually there's forms. We want to make sure there's not liability. There's not. And they thought about it for a minute and they went, come on in. Come on in and help us clean this house out. 
And, and he said this whole group of people, they, they heard their story. They'd woken up and they had gotten together and they'd prayed about it. And God had called them to go and do some cleaning that morning. And so they'd gotten up and driven early that morning. And they stayed for about an hour and a half and cleaned uh, like an army. Just worked as hard as they could, were sweating, had drug a bunch of stuff out. And then they, they stopped and they came to him and they said, well, we think we've done what we can here and we believe God is calling us to another neighborhood. And they got in their cars and they left and went to another neighborhood. He said, I don't know who they were. I don't know their names. All I know is there were people called. And they went and they did what they were called to do. When God gets in us, we get the opportunity to go and do ministry. Well, one final story, and I'll see if I can pull this together. When I was a Boy Scout, we went to El Rancho Sima. I don't know if you know where El Rancho Sima is. Most Scouts do. It's kind of the devil's backbone. Uh, there's a lot of white rocks and scrub brush, and the San Marcos River runs right through the middle of the camp. And I was coming back one day from Merit Badge Camp, and I would noticed in our campsite that there were kind of old trails that were a little bit marked out by some, you know, rocks about the size of your hand. And I decided, well, it's not quite dinner time. Merit Badge class is over. I'm going to just go ahead and straighten this one trail up from our campsite down to the center part. And I started kind of straightening up. And it wasn't too long after that, a friend of mine came along. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, just kind of killing time and doing this. And he goes, can I do it too? And I said, well, sure, go ahead. And so he started working, and then a couple of other guys started coming, and they started doing the same thing. And I was like, well, I was just killing time, but now there's a whole group of other people doing this. And then it became about dinner time, and I thought, well, I better go wash up. I'm getting ready to go. And, and as I stood up and, and started moving away, I noticed around the trees, somebody had done circles. And some of the circles were completely filled in, and some of them looked like wagon wheels, and some of them looked like spirals. And there was uh, all over the place different and beautiful expressions of what it looked like to kind of clean the place up. And I, and I thought about that. I thought, you know, that wasn't my idea, and that wasn't my idea, and this wasn't something that I had planned to do. But all of these people had come along and done this out of a calling that they had and they saw. Jesus tells the story right before this. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And he tells it also as the story of children, that the children who everybody thought was last will be first, because there was a childlike nature. As I think back when I was a scout, there was no intent other than to see the world prettier. There was no wage or no earnings. My prayer for you, my prayer for this church, is may you be so moved by the Holy Spirit that you find where God's passion has been placed in you. And then you'll never worry about being paid. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.